Father, certainly how great you are. You know, in all your wonder and glory, we just, we, we try to change that. We, we try to say, you know, you can't be that glorious. You can't be that wonderful. You can't really love me unconditionally. And yet you do, Lord. We keep saying, no, that's impossible. No one could love me unconditionally. But you do. And we put all these barriers, put all these blockades up. All these teachings that, that keep us from seeing you as you are. But Father, it doesn't change the truth. You love your creation. You love it unconditionally, eternally. What an awesome God you are. In your name, amen. Uh, last week, we um, started, but let me slide this over, see if it's in the lesson for Lauren. Maybe it is. If it's not, Lauren, I have a light bulb here, that a lamp with a light on. <laughs> and what we were saying last week was referring to what John talked about in the gospel and also talked about in his letter. It says, in the beginning was the word. This is John 1. And down in verse 4, it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Skip on down to another verse or two, and it says, John the Baptist was not that light. He was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So putting the verse back in verse four and what we just read here in verse nine, God gives life to every man, doesn't he? Yes, he does, right? And that life is the light in every man. What does it mean for the light to come on? It means the understanding. So when I understand that the life that I have and everything that God has given me comes from him, then the light is coming on, isn't it? Yes. And, and John says, every man has that light. The problem is darkness comes in, right? It gets covered over. And that's the picture here with the cloth that, that covers over the lamp right here. John goes on to talk about, we've touched him. We've handled him. That's actually in 1 John. That which was from the beginning. What was from the beginning? God was the life of all of his creation. That's, that's how he did it. Which makes perfect sense right and and so he he made it and he's the life inside of all anyway this word of life we saw it it was manifested we've seen it we bear witness to it and we declare this eternal life which was with the father and in jesus is what he's actually saying right yeah the logos right and it was manifested to us and we declare this to you and he goes on to say and in god in this relationship, we talked about the word koinonia a few weeks ago, there's a special relationship between the creator and his creation. A koinonia, that's the Greek word, really tight partnership, fellowship, right? And in this, God is, has all light, in him is no darkness at all. I referred to the verse in James where he says there's no shadow of turning in God. And what does that mean? That means you and I have a very special close relationship with the father and there's no darkness on his part at all in that relationship he looks at you with full light if you will in other words there's no there's no what can i say bitterness hatred bad thoughts so to speak about you at all he loves you unconditionally all the darkness is on whose part our part we're the ones that cover over the light. God's not covering himself. We cover ourselves. Who was it that hid in the garden? Did the Lord hide from Adam? No, he came looking for him. It was Adam and Eve. They sinned, so they go, we got to hide, right? They hid from God, right? 
and that's what all men do. We've given this life, but, but, but then we, we cover ourselves and we walk in darkness, okay? And we went on last week to talk about how this answers a lot of systematic theology. I know, Lauren, you went to Bible schools. I don't know if you took systematic theology, but I'm going to solve it for you in five minutes, really. Different breakdowns of systematic theology. Hamartiology is a study of sin. What's sin? It's, it's the dishcloth over the light right here. <laughs> sin is we hide ourselves from God. We hide ourselves from the understanding that he is my, li my life, my provision, my thoughts, my emotions. He's everything to me. Right? And so that's what sin is. Uh, soteriology is a study of salvation. So how do I save this man that's hiding? <laughs> there you go. That's salvation. Take the dishcloth off, right? Yeah, it's very simple. You don't need a junior or senior level course to understand this. Pneumatology is the study of the spirit of God. Pentecostals have all this kind of doctrine, but, but really the spirit of God is that life he put within me when I was in my mother's womb. Do I have any more of that life today than I did when I was in my mother's womb? No. I, I, I can't explain that, except that I don't have any more of God now than I did then. I have more understanding. Well, maybe. <laughs> you know, I, but I hopefully have more understanding of him now and that relationship. But I don't have any more of his life eschatology study of the end times so what is the end times okay. it's all about getting the dishcloth off that's what it is right that's why ad 70 when the temple was finally destroyed the last that remained of that old covenant and don't you remember it's in second corinthians 4 i believe paul says every time the old covenant is read there's a blindness that comes over the people there's a darkness right? That darkness was completely removed when the temple was taken away, done away with. So anyway, there you go with that. And then we have Christology, the study of Christ. This is who he was. He had no darkness. He didn't have a covering. He showed us what it meant to walk with God and who we are, therefore, right? So hey, that's a recap of last week. I want to go into something that's built off of that maybe i'll leave that uncovered so i don't so jordan doesn't have to use his insurance look i've been saying this kind of thing for weeks and months for a while we were talking about the new heavens and the new earth this is walking in the new heavens and new earth i am an expression of the father and so is everybody else i need to see everybody else that way too right? However, there are some verses that seem to contradict what I'm saying. And interestingly, the most striking one, the one that we will have the most difficulty with, is actually in John chapter 2. We went through 1 John chapter 1, then you get over to chapter 2, and, uh, and I don't have it down here, but in verse 1, he's simply encouraging everyone not to sin, all right? And then he says in verse two, we have New King James here, NET. And by the way, Lauren, if you can't read it, I can send you these slides, okay? Reading from the New King James, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We're gonna break that down into three parts. Because you can't read that and not have your brain flip back to what we used to think, right? I do. I mean, you're using such theological words like advocate and propitiation, right? Another word I don't have, well, atonement, of course, right? NET uses atonement over there. Uh, another word that we hear a lot is expiation, which, by the way, that never occurs in the Bible. But, but it fits. It means atonement, okay? 
So what I want to do is break this verse down, and we're going to look at other verses very quickly as well into three parts. We're going to look at the middle part first. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, or NET says, Jesus himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What does that mean? From the Strong's Concordance, that word is halasmos. Well, they put the accent on the last syllable, halasmos, I guess. I don't know. My, my southernese won't do that too well. Anyway, this occurs two times in 1 John 2.2, 2, and it's also going to be in chapter 4. I'll show you in just a minute, all right? I guess I could show you now. What's 410, all right? This says that the Father loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So I don't, I don't get much more information, but it's there. Only two places in Scripture this particular word occurs, all right? Notice that it means an appeasing. It also means propitiation, but that's kind of circular reasoning there. That's not telling me anything. What I really gather from this is it's an appeasing. The means of appeasing, a propitiation. Okay, I'm trying to find out what propitiation means. So anyway, it really means an appeasement, doesn't it? That's what you really gather out of that. All right? There's variations of this word. There's also halaskomai, the top word, uh, that was a noun. Here we are, this one, does it tell me anywhere? Because it says middle voice, right, doesn't it? Ah, it's out there on the corner, yes, verb. This is the verb form of it, right? Two occurrences as well, we have Hebrews and Luke, right? It's translated be merciful in Luke. It's translated make reconciliation or to make a propitiation for, right? I'm not gathering more information about this word here, but I'm just showing you that that occurs as well. Notice the definitions to render oneself, to appease. Again, we have that word. To conciliate to oneself, that, to make reconciliation, all right? To be propitious, wow, circular, gracious, merciful, to expiate. That's where expiation comes in. Expiate means to remove, to make propitiation for. All right. Last one. Another form of the same word, hilasterion. Hilasterion. How, how are they saying it? Hilasterion. It occurs twice. Romans 3.25, we'll look at this one a lot more in just a few moments, to, that Jesus made propitiation by his blood. Notice the NET translates it as the mercy seat, that, that which was on the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, right? Rested right on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and so anyway, you see the same kind of thing, a lot of wording. What you really gather from all of this is that it means to appease, really. Right? That's, that's the only new information I really got on the definition of the word. We're going to come back to this. Every time the word atonement occurs in the Old Testament, written in the Hebrew, right? When the Septuagint writers translators. This was the 70 Jewish scribes that uh, Ptolemy brought down into Egypt and said, let's create a Greek version of, of the Bible in that day, the Old Testament. It's around 250 BC. And these scholars, every time they got to the word atonement, they took the Hebrew word kafar, which means to cover. When they got ready to translate into Greek, they should have used the word kalupto, which means to cover. Instead, they used the word we've been looking at, hilasterion, a form of it, which means to appease, which is a fascinating concept, right? We're not just covering over something. We are 
appeasing the situation, right? Now, all of this isn't new. You've heard that the that Jesus sacrifice was to appease the, the father, right? You've heard that, right? To appease his wrath, correct? Am I right? Yes. All right. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah. Oh, man. We love Jordan. Um, let's suppose that I did something really, really bad. That's not hard to suppose, but let's suppose. And Jerry saw it, and he was highly offended. I mean, it was really bad, whatever it was, okay? I, I, I mean, it really caused a huge break in our relationship. And I went up to Jerry, and I said, look, man, I, it's not what you think. You know, it's, 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 you're not seeing the whole story. And, and I, I reason with him, and he won't, he won't listen to me. And I come back to him over, but Jerry, it's not what you think. I really want to repair this relationship, but, 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 but you're not seeing the whole picture, and I can't explain it any better than I already have. And he won't hear me. What do I do? What options do I have? I talk to Patty. Patty, what am I going to do? I, you know, I can't get along with your husband anymore. I can't, what, what's, and, and I said, and so I come up with this idea, either I do or you do. I haven't figured out how to tell the story yet. But anyway, you know, we know Jerry likes to read, right? And I get this brilliant idea. I know he loves Sherlock Holmes, right? So I find an, a first edition copy of the works of Sherlock Holmes in London. I fly over to London spend Philomena's new huge paycheck. <laughs> Cost us a lot. I bring it back and I come up to him and I say, Jerry, you're never going to understand why I've done what I've done. You never will. But I want to appease your wrath, your anger, and bridge this relationship so we will be at one again. Which, by the way, that English word atonement used to mean that in the 1500s. It used to mean on a human level, really, to be at one again. We used to have a problem. Now we're at one. We'd never use that that way today. It's purely theological now. But that's the understanding of it. I'm going to appease your wrath so we can be at one. Right? And he accepts it. Now, now we're just we're covering over what happened. You'll never understand why, right? And all we can do is say, look, this is the goodness of my heart. Just trust I'm a good person and let's move on from here. We're going to cover over the past and move on. Do you hear what I'm saying here? Who's angry? Whose wrath am I covering over? Who am I appeasing? I'm sending the best offering I can find, the most expensive offering I could get, right? And giving it to the one who's angry at me. You hear me? When there's a break in our relationship with the Father, who's the, who, with whom is there the break? It's with men, right? In this broken relationship, who is angry at whom? Is the father angry at us? Uh, don't think about what you've been taught, <laughs> right? Oh, man, my mom was so heavy into genealogy and traced back our records. And we were, we were, we were, I'm apparently kin to Jonathan Edwards who preached that great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, he's, look, he's a wonderful man of God, and he lived in a different day and age, so whatever, right? But we have that concept in our head. Who is angry in this relationship? Men are, right? So God sent his son as an offering, as an appeasement, to appease whom? Or who, whichever. Men. This isn't an offering he gave to himself. 
if I had gone to London and purchased Sherlock Holmes' book and given it to myself, I'd be dead by her. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, God didn't send Jesus and kill him to appease himself. How warped is that reasoning? That is this, one of the stupidest things when you really get away and look at it. You mean, Father, that you can't control your anger so much <laughs> that you had to kill your perfect son just to calm your anger a little bit? Is that what you did? Oh, there's a show you got to watch. Oh, I got to show the trailer next week. I'm not set up today. We found a show. What's it called? Almost Paradise. We found it on, uh, what's the Am uh, Amazon Prime or whatever. Yeah, I don't know if it's anywhere else or not, but it's about this ex-DEA agent who can't control his temper. I love it. It's a great show. <laughs> it's funny. But anyway, that's what we think of God. He's just like, oh. you know, fortunately, Jesus died. Or I just, I'd burn you all in hell. <laughs> what kind of wacko God is that? And that's our father? Oh, please. Is there any other God I can choose from? Really? <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding about all of that, right? But that's, that's our concept of this father. How did we get so warped in our thinking? John is saying just the opposite, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's no shadow of turning on the father's part. He sent his son. You'll never understand why the father's done certain things. You cannot, I cannot. It's beyond our comprehension, at least here on earth. We never will, right? So he's saying, look, let's just bridge our relationship, right? This is the best offering I can give you to show you how much I love you. My son died on the cross with outstretched arms to a dying world. Why have you forsaken me? Right? He's saying that to the world too, right? And so, and so it's to reach out to men. Let's just cover the past. You'll never understand it. Right? And let's move on from here. Let's walk and tell it. What a fresh view. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. Wow. He did that to appease me. And then I start to think about that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, Lord. I, you did that just to appease my wrath? Because I, I, I couldn't see the Father? Really? He didn't have to die for us. But it was necessary. <laughs> I'm so, yeah, questions. I'm sorry. I'm wrapped up in it. Yeah. We are. Yes, we are. Uh-huh. Oh, you're going to make it hard on me. So, if he had to die, yes. what was the purpose of Jesus' life and ministry? If the ultimate appeasement came with the death, did we learn anything from Jesus' life, his ministry? I would suggest we did. I'm just curious how that all fit together. I think tying into what John saw that what we saw in Jesus life and ministry was an expression of the father being in him but most people couldn't see it so that's, and that's really my question is did could anybody see it I'm sure some did, did. I, I said we say no one did I'm sure some did but it didn't really become clear until he died I think Maybe because that's what really grabbed our attention. You know, he, he, he dies at that point. You know, even Lazarus, who we say is the beloved disciple, it didn't click in him about Jesus till he saw the grave clothes, the empty grave. And then he, he believed at that point. And then like right? the guys on the road to Emmaus, where they say, didn't, didn't, don't, don't you remember he did this? And he did so maybe that is that is it. Just yeah. kind of curious about. I know his ministry was important, but how does that all work? It's his ministry, really. It's his life and ministry. That should have been all we needed. It should have been. 
John, John really is basing his whole argument in here on the fact that we saw him, we touched him, we handled him. We saw the word of life, right? But it doesn't appear to have clicked until he died. And then why did he die? Why did he die? That's how much I love you, right? As an appeasement. That brings up the one other part of that verse. Back to 1 John 2, 2. Well, if, l- let me just back up for just, oh, it may not back. It's supposed to back up. Let me, let me go back. Um, am I there? Yeah. Uh, yes, read it out. Oh, that's great. <laughs> what? It's the opposite. Well, see, penal substitution, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Penal substitution means that I'm being sent to hell. That's really what it is. And, uh, and so, Jesus paid my price on the cross to keep me out of hell. I'm not saying that at all. Yeah, so I, I'm being careful, and, and Lauren, maybe, maybe I'm not being clear, and maybe I don't have it quite right. So if there's verses you can think of that contradict this, please let me know, and I'll, I'll correct it. I think I'm totally contradicting penal substitution because we don't have a God who's angry and wrathful at his children because they've made mistakes, right? He's not destining us for hell. All mankind's not destined for hell, I don't believe. And and so what we had was Jesus coming to release us from our bondage of darkness. We had the wrong image of the Father. And even though some of that certainly has come through in modern Christianity, we still try to darken it with thoughts like penal substitution, right? That there's a price that has to be paid. Well, well, look, see, this is where words are so insufficient. Yes, there was a price that had to be paid for my sin, because if it wasn't paid, I never would have seen the truth. But it wasn't a price to be paid to keep me out of eternal hell. Am I saying all of this right, I hope? I'm thinking off the spot, so I hope I get it right, Lauren. But yes, I am being contradictory to the normal concept of penal substitution. Um, I want to look at one other verse in all of these. The rest of these, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's good too. Uh, well, let's just look at this one, Hebrew. In all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, right? Uh, appeasement for the sins of the people. He's able to appease because he understands and he cares. All right. Read this from Romans. This is, I, I like this. This is very uh, interesting. There is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Oh, that's a big one on the Roman road, right? This is the Reformation for you right here. Might not be big in Lauren's book. She's ex-Catholic as Philomena is too, right? But uh, Sarah, you may have been as well. Were you Catholic? A Presbyterian? Okay, okay. I'm not going to say, ah, there was something that came up. This is recorded. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> All right. Anyway, this is the basis of our, of our Reformation movement. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the, that, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a mercy seat as a propitiation, as an appeasement by his blood through faith to demonstrate 
This word demonstrate, this isn't reading like I thought it was. It's just to show forth publicly. Okay, but anyway, we can, this, this really has the, the concept. It's in the Greek. It's not in the, to, to show forth publicly, to demonstrate, to declare, right? His righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just. In other words, Jesus was on the cross to demonstrate, to show that the Father had already forgiven all the sins. Uh, there's a Greek word there. I think it's just to show forth publicly. Oh, here it is. N-E-T. Through the redemption, of God publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat, as the atonement, as the appeasement. Right for the wrath of man. Here he is. Does this almost? And I don't mean this. And God didn't mean it sarcastically. But does does this appease you? Will this satisfy you? You're angry at me. Will this satisfy you? That's that's kind of what he's saying there. Right. Okay. So anyway, I find that fascinating. But let's let's go on to uh, the word advocate. Whoa, I'm talking too long these days. I got to get back to the 15-minute sermons, don't I? But anyway, real quickly, another word we have a problem with is if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the appeasement for our sins, not for ours only, but for also the whole world, right? So we talked about appeasement. What do you do with advocate? Some people say this is a, a, a law term, that he's an attorney and that kind of thing. The word is parakletos. It's, it's uh, the prefix, the para, means beside or next to. Kletos means called or invited. So a paraclete is one who's called to come alongside, right? We have one who's called alongside who is with the Father. He is Jesus Christ the righteous. What made Jesus righteous? The fact that he never sinned? What made him righteous? The fact that the Father was with him and declared him righteous. What makes you righteous or you holy? The fact that the Father's with you and he says, you're my child, so you're holy. You are, because you're mine. That's what he says. And so we have, this word is sometimes translated comforter. Remember the Holy Spirit's called a paraclete? Right? Jesus even calls him that. It just means one who's called alongside to comfort or to help or to assist. It certainly can be an attorney if you're in that situation, right? But just one who comes alongside. So the, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit is with us. He comes alongside, right, to help us remember, hey, you're not your own. You belong to God, right? And he comforts us. Jesus is with the Father, always has been, always. And that picture of the Father being with Jesus is a comforter as well, isn't it? That's all this is saying. Jesus is not an attorney in heaven's courtroom saying, please don't strike Jordan down today. <laughs> no, don't strike him down for his sin. That's Sarah you're listening to. That's not Jordan. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> right? No. Jesus isn't having to beg the Father not to strike us down. He is a comforting picture, sign that I can call alongside as my elder brother. This is who he was. This is who I am. Father, we thank you this morning. You are so good. And Lord, I just ask that uh, let us go with these comforting words. It really isn't difficult. Theology really isn't difficult. We make it so, but it's not. So, Father, I just, I just pray, speak into our hearts your love and your comfort. We bless you. Amen.